Hello, this is Gary LaRude, Technical Editor at Microwave Journal. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar with John Coonrod of Rogers Corporation. He will be discussing how dielectric constant test methods affect time to market and how this knowledge will help you design right the first time. Before we begin John's presentation, let me cover a few items about the ON24 webinar platform. In the center of your screen, you'll see a window containing the presentation. You may enlarge this to full screen to have a better view of the slides. The window on your screen labeled Resource List contains a copy of the presentation, which you may download at any time. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay within about an hour after we conclude, allowing you to watch it again and recommend it to colleagues who weren't able to join this live event. You'll find a link to the recording in the events section of the Microwave Journal website. If you have technical problems, please click on the yellow box with the question mark at the bottom of your screen. It will take you to a helpful user's guide. After John's presentation, we'll have time for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, just type it in the Q&A box on your screen. Now let me introduce John Coonrod, today's speaker. John is a Technical Marketing Manager for the Advanced Connectivity Solutions Division at Rogers Corporation. He's been involved with the printed circuit board industry for 30 years now. About half this time he spent with flexible PCBs doing circuit design, applications, processing, and materials engineering. For the past 15 years, John has been engaged with high-frequency circuit materials, including circuit fabrication, application support, and electrical characterization. John chairs the IPC D24C High Frequency Test Methods Task Group, and he received a Bachelor's in Electrical Engineering from Arizona State University. John, welcome, and I'll turn the screen over to you now. Very good. Thank you very much, and welcome all. Uh, thanks for the attendance. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, dielectric constant test methods and also some printed circuit board fabrication influences that can affect uh, time to market. The uh, agenda I plan on following is shown here. I'm going to start off with uh, talking about Design DK. Uh, for any of you that have seen some of these webinars, I usually do talk some about Design DK because it really is an important item. Uh, and if you have seen this before, I apologize for being repetitive, but uh, again, it's actually pretty important, so I want to go through that. And then after that, I want to talk about something related to Design DK, and that is the variation that you can see uh, from circuit to circuit, batch to batch, things like that. And then after that, I'll talk about some normal variations in high-frequency circuit materials, uh, some things that uh, you may know of and some things that are a little unusual that sometimes can uh, be important to understand. Printed circuit board fabrication influences, and then we'll talk about some uh, end-use environmental uh, conditions and how that can affect uh, PCB performance and, and how you can account for it as well. So uh, let's get started first off talking with Design DK. On our product selector guide and on our data sheets, you'll see that we have uh, dielectric constant DK in two different categories, process DK, design DK. The process DK is testing the raw material with the industry standard test method by IPC. It's a clamping fixture type of test, and it works really good for how we use it, but uh, sometimes it gives a number that is not appropriate for circuit design. And because of that, we've went off and did, uh, uh, did a test method that's using an actual circuit, microstrip transmission line circuit, and define the dielectric constant as the material as used in circuit form. So basically, the process DK is what we're using internally, and it's looking at the raw material properties. The design DK is also looking at raw material properties, but it's actually circuit-related, so there's more influences, and it's actually a better real-world type of number to use. So with that, uh, let's go through some basic concepts. Uh, as I think you're mostly, most of you are probably aware, if you have an electromagnetic wave zipping around in free space and it encounters another medium that is a higher dielectric constant, the wave does several things, and basically it compresses. You get a shorter wavelength, a um, little lower amplitude, and then also it slows down. So for the next few slides, I want to talk about the wave speed. And that is uh, a wave speed that is slower is perceived as a higher dielectric constant or a higher dielectric constant can be understood as a slower wave. And what we found over the years, and we have several papers on this, by the way, that there's other things that can slow the wave down besides the dielectric constant of the material or the medium. 
and that is copper surface roughness. And we have found that if you build two circuits on the exact same substrate, one using smooth copper, one using rough copper, the circuit with the rougher copper will have a longer electrical length and a slower wave, and that's going to be perceived by the circuit as a higher dielectric constant, even though the substrate's the same. And a good way to illustrate that is a uh, chart that's shown here. We did the study several years ago, and the substrate is using formula LCP, and it's the same lot of LCP. Everything's the same for the dielectric, so we tried to keep the dielectric the same as much as possible, but we used four different types of copper, and uh, we measured the copper surface roughness, uh, non-contact laser profilometer, before we made these laminates, and we made four different laminates with the exact same substrate with different copper roughness, knowing what the roughness was, sent off these laminates, had circuits made, came back, we did our microstrip differential phase length method, and I'll explain that test method a little bit later. And what we get is uh, the effective dielectric constant on the y-axis and frequency on the x, and you can see that the circuits using the smooth copper red curve, that's got a copper roughness about 0.5 microns RMS, had the lowest effective dielectric constant, and it's a very distinct trend there. The circuits use the little bit rougher one, 0.7 microns RMS, green curve is a little higher effective dielectric constant, and you get the idea. The one with the highest uh, surface roughness is the blue curve, 3.0 microns RMS, and that had the highest effective dielectric constant. And there's a difference there of about 0.3 in effective dielectric constant while using the exact same substrate. So it's the copper roughness that's slowing the wave down. Rougher copper, slower wave, that is perceived as a higher effective dielectric constant. So that's um, how the, the copper roughness actually affects things. Um, then looking at the thickness dependency. So design DK does have a thickness dependency, and what I mean by that is uh, if you look at microstrip transmission line circuits, and that's the type of testing I'm doing here, again, the microstrip differential phase length method, and in this case, the y-axis is the extracted dielectric constant of the material, and then on the x-axis is frequency, and what I'm showing is the green curve is a uh, material that is using 5 mil RO3003 laminate, the blue curve is 10 mil RO3003 laminate, and red is the 20 mil thick. So really what it's showing is the thinner the circuit, the more it is affected by this copper roughness. And in this case, the copper roughness for this particular ED copper is about 2 microns RMS. Now, if you actually made a circuit that was thicker, let's say about 50 mil thick, then what would happen is that curve should settle in right about 3.0 because the intrinsic value of the substrate is 3.0. And once the copper planes are moved far enough apart, in the case of a thick laminate, then the uh, surface roughness does not affect the wave velocity anymore, and you're really looking at the intrinsic value of uh, the dielectric constant of the material. Now, another way to look at this, too, is, again, using the RO3003 laminate, in this case, it's going to be thin, 5 mils thick, but I use two different coppers, and one is a rolled copper, the orange curve, and the other one, blue, is the ED copper. The blue curve has a uh, surface roughness average about 2.0 microns RMS, even though my notes say 1.8. More recent data says it's a little bit rougher than that. And then the uh, orange curve, rolled copper, has surface roughness about 0.35, again, we have 0.3 in the notes here, but actually the more recent data says it's just a hair rougher than that. Still very good, though. And what you can see is the smooth copper, even though it's thin and these copper planes are close together, the smooth copper of the rolled copper, the orange curve, is pretty close to the uh, intrinsic dielectric constant of the material at 3.0. And that's because the very smooth copper is really not slowing the wave down. The blue curve with the rougher copper is slowing the wave down. And again, a slower wave means higher dielectric constant. There's also dispersion, and uh, many of you are probably aware of dispersion in the sense of transmission line dispersion, that microstrip is more dispersive than strip line, and that's all true, but there is material dispersion, and what's meant by that is the dielectric constant will change with a change in frequency. And as a general statement, uh, as you go out higher and higher in frequency, the dielectric constant will slightly decrease in the range of frequencies that we look at anyway. So microwave and lower millimeter wave range of frequencies, an increase of frequency means a slight decrease in dielectric constant. And this dispersion is due to a few things. One is uh, material polarization in a molecular sense, and then also loss characteristics. And how this works is when electric field is applied to a dielectric material, uh, there are dipole moments that are established, and when the electric field is turned off, they relax. And when these fields are turned on and off faster and faster, they get to the point where they do not fully relax. And that dipole relaxation 
actually adds some energy to the electric flux, which relates to dielectric constant. And then what you get is a curve shown here that's out of um, basically a material science text. And it's showing that in the range of frequencies that we're interested in normally, the microwave uh, lower millimeter wave range, uh, there is a change in dielectric constant with a change in frequency, higher frequency, lower dielectric constant. This is actually a generic curve, though, for a, a generic material anyway. Most of the high frequency uh, circuit materials has that same uh, trend, but a lot more gentle slope. And then just to give you kind of a feel for this, uh, what I did was I did a study on the exact same sheet of material and used three different test methods, really trying to confirm that that trend is valid, that an increase of frequency means lower dielectric constant. The first test method I did is FSR, full sheet resonance, and that's actually testing the copper clad laminate itself. And um, I did that testing to two different nodes, node 10, about 175 megahertz, node 20, 350. And sure enough, you can see on the chart here, the red dot and the green triangle. An increase of frequency means a decrease in dielectric constant. Then I sent that panel off to how circuits made, and some of these circuits were ring resonators. One gigahertz ring resonator had a higher dielectric constant than the five gigahertz ring resonator. Again, the trend was verified. And then, of course, the thick blue curve there is the microstrip transmission lines differential phase length method, and you can see that an increase of frequency decreases the dielectric constant. So that general trend I showed on the previous chart of the material dispersion appears to be correct. And we have tested this many times in the past as well. Um, and then there's the how do you find the design decay? And that's a pretty good question because on our data sheet and our product selector guide, we just give one number. And we do that because there is so many different dependencies for design decay, we can't put all that information in a document. So I think the smartest idea was is to put this information in a software. And now what we have on our website and our technology support hub, you can download the software that's MWI 2017. It is an impedance modeling software. It also does some basic loss calculations for a simple transmission lines like microstrip and strip line, things like that. But also embedded in the software is the design decay. So I have a whole bunch of data in there from measuring actual circuits that's embedded in the software. And how you use this is uh, once you start up the software, you click on the material of interest. Then you click on the thickness of the material. And then in this case, we're interested in, in a frequency uh, application. Maybe uh, in this case, I'm showing 3 gigahertz. So it could be you're interested in the design decay for a 3 gigahertz uh, directional coupler or something like that that's very frequency specific. So you put in the, the frequency of interest and then click on the button here that says decay values for RF or uh, frequency related. And in the DK window, you'll see the number that was measured at that frequency with that material and that type of copper. And we know what the copper roughness is as well. So that's all accounted for. Now, if you're a printed circuit board fabricator, a lot of times they're looking at trying to just understand uh, characteristic impedance. So a lot of times they're trying to uh, ship a, a product that needs to be 50 ohms plus or minus something, and they're testing it with a TDR. And in that case, I have an option, um, the third one down, that is a dielectric constant uh, for characteristic impedance, and you can use that for um, high-speed digital applications or very wideband applications. And again, the same thing. You would pick the desired material, then pick the thickness. And in this case, you don't worry about frequency because it's really considered a wideband uh, type of uh, number that I'm generating. And then in the design decay window, you'll find the number that was uh, measured. And in this case, really what I'm doing is taking those design decay curves across a range of frequencies and averaging the design decay in the range of frequencies where um, the curve is uh, less dispersive, let's say. So that's how you find the design decay. And it is available on our Rogers Technology Support Hub. Uh, the software is free for download. And we also have apps on there. And I'll talk about that a little later. So um, the big questions uh, from time to time about design decay is how much variation should I expect? And uh, basically asking for a tolerance. And there really is no tolerance for design decay, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, but what design decay is, it's not a material property. It's actually a circuit property. And what I mean by that, uh, a material property like CTE, coefficient of thermal expansion, the material is going to expand and contract a certain amount due to the CTE when it, the material is heated and cooled. That's a property of the material only. But design decay is not a property of material only. There's actually circuit influences. Uh, there are several different influences, circuit fabrication, design. So it's actually a circuit property. 
And along those same lines, there's several variables. There's uh, thickness of the substrate, there's copper type, copper roughness, there's frequency. There's several fabrication variables as well. So it's really difficult to put together a design decay tolerance. And if you did, it'd be very specific for a particular grade of material, thickness, copper type, all that stuff. So I've uh, given a list of some of the variables here. And what we've been working on the last uh, few years, actually, is trying to collect enough information on some of our materials to where we can get a uh, statistically solid um, verification of what the overall design decay range is. So we get the average and the overall min and max of a large population of uh, circuits that's been made on one particular material from many, many different lots over a long time frame. So that's really the right way to do this, I think. And I'll give you an example of something we uh, did similar this is actually for a different reason, but it's kind of giving the same idea that we're trying to figure out what the range of the design decay is. In this particular case, what I was doing, though, was something a little different. And we know that the copper surface roughness does vary. It's not always the same number. So when we get a high-profile copper that's used on the standard RO4350B laminate, um, that copper has an average roughness of 2.8 microns RMS, but it does vary up and down some. And we know that uh, the variation of the copper surface roughness will vary the design decay. So I did an experiment where we kept the same substrate, so we have minimal uh, substrate dielectric constant variation. Kept the same substrate, same lot of material, same everything. The only difference was we used 14 different lots of copper that had different roughness and in the range that we expect the roughness to vary. And uh, made the circuits, did the microstrip uh, differential phase length method, and the upper right chart is showing the range of design decay that we see from just copper roughness variation only. Now, the uh, bottom left chart is using basically the same substrate. It's RO4350B low pro laminate, and the low pro is basically a, a lower profile copper, smoother copper. And in this case, what we see using the smoother copper, we see less variation, and it's just a, a natural thing. If the copper has a uh, more intrinsically smooth surface, then it's just going to have less surface roughness variation. So for designs where uh, phase response needs to be very consistent, then using a smoother copper is definitely a good thing to do because you have more consistency there. And just, uh, again, for the numbers, the surface roughness on the standard RO4350B laminate, 2.8 microns RMS average, and then the low-pro copper that's used on the 4350B low-pro laminate, that's 0 0.8 microns RMS roughness average. And, of course, also you get the benefit of uh, less insertion loss with smoother copper. So uh, I'm going to pass on this chart because I'm going to talk about it a little bit later again. So let's move on. Now, design decay is also design specific, and that means that we are collecting this information using a microstrip transmission line, but it can be slightly different for a ground coplanar waveguide and can be um, a lot different, actually, for a strip line circuit, depending on how a strip line circuit is made. And here I'm given two examples of uh, strip line circuits being made, one with uh, core construction on top, and then the construction on the bottom is foil lamb. So basically, you get the strip line structure out of both of these ways, uh, two different ways of making the circuit. You get the ground signal ground from top to bottom configuration as a strip line, but you can make it different. So the core construction is actually using two different laminates and then a bonding material between uh, the top laminate that had its uh, one copper layer etched off. And that case, we understand and we would know the copper surface roughness of three of the four uh, copper substrate interfaces. We would not know the fourth one, which would be the smooth side of the bottom laminate. And the reason we say that is because we know what that smooth copper is. We know what that surface roughness is when it leaves our facility as a laminate. But in uh, making a strip line circuit, they typically will alter that surface with an alternative oxide or something to enhance the bonding. And that does affect the copper surface roughness. So that's one issue, is a strip line circuit has different um, areas that can have different type of, uh, or different copper surface roughness. And then the other construction is the foil lamb construction on the bottom, and that's where you just use a laminate and a bonding material only to make a three copper layer structure. And in this case, the foil lamb on top is the choice of the fabricator many times, and that could be a different copper surface roughness than what is used in laminate. And because of that, now you probably only know the copper substrate interface roughness of the laminate only, which is the two interfaces, and you have two other interfaces that's rather unknown. So that's a, a variable that's kind of hard to deal with for design decay. 
And I'll give you an example of this, and, and I've done this a few times before. When it gets uh, in the strip line circuits where you have this variation of surface uh, roughness, the copper surface roughness, uh, normally it's a, probably a good idea to get a hold of your application development managers or the tech support engineers from Rogers or myself. And what we end up doing is just uh, giving you a pretty good educated guess. And so far, we've actually been pretty good at this, but it does take a little bit of thought. And here's an example where a strip line circuit is made up of a combination of laminates and prepregs or bonding material. And the prepreg that's on the bottom layer between bottom ground and the signal layer in the middle, that prepreg layer is not affected by copper effects. So there is no copper effect as that prepreg would perceive it. And that means you should really use the design decay, which is the intrinsic dielectric constant of the raw material itself. And using that exact same prepreg on a different layer in the circuit, you would actually use a different number for design decay. And that's the bonding material on the top side. So the top ground plane and the signal in the middle, that bonding material is actually seeing roughened copper on the top side and smoother copper probably where the, it interfaces with the signal plane. So that's a little bit trickier. And I've given a table of information here if you're using the RO4450F prepreg. And this is just a reference. It's a pretty good reference just from doing a lot of studies on this topic. Uh, but again, if you're not comfortable with um, these type of issues on a strip line structure or any kind of mixed material structure, then uh, please contact us and we'll do what we can to help you. So uh, let me talk about some normal variations of high frequency materials. Uh, here's some cross-sectional views of some of the common materials used in the high frequency industry. Uh, there's more types of materials than this, but this is just kind of a generic uh, two types of materials, PTFE-based and hard hydrocarbon-based. The PTFE-based materials uh, can be woven glass or can be non-woven glass or typically are woven glass, and a lot of times it is ceramic filled with woven glass. The uh, bottom right picture on the right is actually uh, a little unusual, and that is ceramic filled PTFE with no woven glass, and that's actually our RO3003 that is uh, a laminate used in 77 gigahertz millimeter wave applications. And there's definitely some benefits to not having glass. Uh, anyway, as a general statement, the hydrocarbon materials, they're thermostat, and the PTFE are thermal plastic. And the thermoplastic PTFE materials uh, typically have lower losses, but they're a little bit more difficult for circuit fabrication. The hydrocarbon-based uh, materials, they're a little bit higher in losses, still pretty good though, and they are typically a little bit easier for making a circuit. So uh, just looking at some of the properties that uh, we publish, uh, we actually publish a lot of properties, and if you do run into something where we don't have the properties published that you're interested in, definitely contact us. We have a lot of information on all of our materials. But in general, dielectric constant dissipation factor, of course, is uh, uh, some pretty major topics when looking at materials. Uh, but there are some other topics of, uh, or other properties of materials that can be pretty important. Thermal coefficient of dielectric constant, moisture absorption, uh, peel strength, there's several of them. And I'll talk about a few of those and some variations that you might see. Uh, to begin with, though, dielectric constant is not the same on all axis of the materials usually. Most of the PCB high frequency materials are anisotropic, meaning the dielectric constant is different on the X axis, Y axis, and the Z axis. And in this case, I'm calling the Z axis the thickness axis. And uh, why that's anisotropy, uh, why the material anyway has anisotropy actually is several reasons. One is sometimes it's the glass reinforcement that is unbalanced where you have a higher percentage of glass on one axis than the other. Uh, sometimes it could be fill, filler particles that are used that are, are maybe a hot dog shape, if you can imagine that. If you have a pile of hot dogs and you put a lot of pressure on there, they actually want to orient one direction naturally. And so some filler particles actually want to orient one direction more than another. And then uh, there is just some directional characteristics of certain types of materials that are made as well. So anisotropy is a pretty common issue with high frequency materials. And uh, there's a tensor that actually relates that in a mathematical sense shown here, but really what we normally do, we normally ignore the non-diagonal elements of, uh, of this uh, array. And the reason why is just because they are very insignificant if you really look at the details normally. And then the uh, epsilon sub XX, epsilon sub YY, that's usually numbers that are very similar. And in electromagnetic modeling software, they usually assume those to be the same number. And if you get into measuring materials, you'll find uh, that is actually a valid assumption usually, but also it's very difficult to measure one axis separate than the other. 
and more test methods that deal with that can measure the XY plane much more accurately than one axis versus the other. So in general, uh, we think of the XY plane versus the Z axis as the anisotropy differences of materials. And um, most of the uh, circuit designs that are not edge coupled uh, are usually not that sensitive to anisotropy. So like a transmission line circuit, uh, mostly that's used in uh, the, electrical pro the electrical fields are mostly used in the Z axis. Uh, so the anisotropy and how much different the DK is on the XY plane doesn't affect that usually. Uh, of course, there's fringing fields and things like that that's probably picking up a little bit of the XY plane for transmission line. But the big issue normally is edge coupled features like um, maybe a microstrip uh, edge coupled bandpass filter or edge coupled directional couplers and things like that. That's usually where anisotropy comes into play. And just as a general rule for anisotropy in materials, uh, usually the materials with woven glass reinforcement are more anisotropic than the materials without woven glass. And then also another general statement is the higher the dielectric constant, the more anisotropy in general. There are exceptions. We do have some materials that we formulate to be isotropic with a high dielectric constant, which is kind of unusual. But if you look at the chart I've given here, you can see the lower dielectric constant RO3003 materials, the Z-axis 3.00 and the XY plane measured as S with SPDR, which is split post dielectric resonator. That's a dielectric constant of 3.07, so it's pretty close to being the same. As you go up in a dielectric constant, the RO3006 laminate, you can see there is a bigger difference, and the RO3010 laminate, you can see a very significant difference. And also, if you want to look at the difference in glass, the RO3003 and the RO3203 are the same materials, except the 3203 has glass reinforcement, and the RO3003 doesn't. And you can see that the RO3203 has a little more anisotropy than the RO3003. So these are kind of general trends to keep in mind. Um, let's talk about some other properties. Moisture absorption, uh, that's an issue that comes up uh, from time to time a lot, actually. And uh, all materials are going to absorb some amount of moisture. And that's normal, and depending on the material formulation, it could be better or worse. Uh, but understanding that can be a really uh, big deal, obviously, depending on what kind of application you have. If it's outside where it can't absorb uh, moisture from the humidity in the air, then that's uh, a pretty important topic. So basically what happens is, as the circuit absorbs uh, moisture, water vapor from the air uh, through humidity, then uh, the dielectric constant is going to increase and also the dissipation factor is going to increase. And a good rule of thumb is moisture absorption of 0.3% or less is considered good. And uh, that's an okay number. And you'll see as I show a little bit more data on this that uh, in some cases that may not be good. It may need to be even a little bit lower than that. TCDK, thermal coefficient of dielectric constant, also sometimes called temperature coefficient of dielectric constant. Basically what that is is how much the dielectric constant will change with a change in temperature. And all materials have TCDK, some materials much worse than others. Uh, we formulate our materials to have very low TCDK. And uh, the unit of measure is parts per million per degree C. And that's basically saying the dielectric constant is going to change in parts per million for every change of temperature in degree C. And the general rule of thumb there is uh, a material to be considered good for TCDK would have a uh, 50 parts per million per degree C or less. Ideal would be zero, or in other words, no change in dielectric constant with a change in temperature. So here's a chart that is uh, looking at the TCDK behavior of several different materials. And to begin with, I'll look at the uh, purple curve here. And the purple curve you can see has a pretty good transition around the room temperature changes in temperatures. And that's actually normal for PTFE-based material. If we were showing a, a pure PTFE-based material, this curve around uh, room temperature would be exaggerated much more than this. And then the light blue curve just below there, you can see that has less uh, effect, uh, or it is less affected by room temperatures anyway. And that's just due to differences in formulations that we know how to control that. And then the dark blue curve that's hovering really close to the 1.0 perfect line, that's actually our RO3003 materials. And those materials have a TCDK of three parts per million per degree C, which is just about perfect, perfect being zero. Anyway, the dark blue line you can see from left to right going from minus 50 degree C up to plus 150 degree C. There is very little var variation in that. And that is really due to using the right combinations of fillers and different uh, magical things that we throw into the laminate to control different properties. In this case, we're controlling TCDK very well. 
So let's talk about some printed circuit board fabrication influences. Uh, to begin with, um, there are several things in printed circuit board fabrication that can cause RF performance differences, and one of them is metal finishes. So, of course, when a circuit's made, it's not shipped with bare copper because over time the bare copper is going to tarnish and it could be a reliability issue. So normally the bare copper is covered up with a solder mask or covered up with a different metal that ages better or it can be in the environment without tarnishing. And uh, these different metals typically have lower conductivity than the copper, which translates to having worse conductor losses, and that's going to affect the insertion loss. So worse conductor loss means worse insertion loss. The exception would be silver. And there is an immersion silver process used to make printed circuit boards, and that silver is uh, definitely more conductive than copper, which is a good thing, but it's also applied so extremely thin that the benefit of the higher conductivity of silver is probably not going to be realized until you get to very high frequencies where the skin depth is thin enough that it's using mostly the silver. And here's a good example of the influences of plated finishes being related to circuit thickness, and there's also a circuit design relationship. But here I'm looking at the exact same circuit design. It's microstrip transmission lines using the same material. It's RO4003C laminates, and in this case, I had laminates built on 20 mil thick. I'm sorry, I had circuits built on 20 mil thick laminate, and also had circuits built on 8 mil thick laminate. So I'm showing differences on, in the substrate thickness. I'm maintaining 50 ohms for the microstrip transmission lines, and I'm comparing bare copper to ENIG. ENIG is electrus nickel immersion gold. ENIG is usually pretty lossy because the nickel is about a quarter of the, the uh, conductivity than copper. Also, there's some magnetic losses associated with nickel as well. But anyway, if you look at the thicker circuits, the blue curve and the red curve, that is the 20 mil thick RO4003C laminate used to make these microstrip transmission lines. Blue curve is circuits with bare copper. Red curve is circuits with the ENIG. And there's a difference of 0.21 dB per inch losses at uh, 25 gigahertz. And then same material, same everything, same design, except now thinner, maintaining 50 ohms as well. The 8 mil thick substrate and the circuits from that, you can see the green curve are the 8 mil thick circuits with bare copper, and the purple curve at the bottom are the same thing, 8 mil thick circuits, but now it's using ENIG. And the difference in the insertion loss there at 25 gigahertz is 30, uh, 0.38 dB per inch. So this shows that a thinner circuit is more affected by conductor effects, and in this case, the conductor effects is a more lossy conductor due to the nickel than copper. Um, so there is a design dependency to the influence of these plated finishes. And a lot of times I'm asked, why does microstrip, uh, why is it affected by uh, these different plated finishes when most of the fields are between the signal plane and the ground plane? And at that interface, these plated finishes do not have influence. So the plated finishes are actually on the side walls of the conductor and the top of the conductor. But if you look at electromagnetic modeling, you'll find that at the corners where the conductor meets the substrate, there is a high current density and there is strong electric fields. And it's that corner effect that actually increases the losses due to a reduced conductivity of the metal finish. So it's really a corner effect at the corners of the uh, signal conductor meeting the substrate. And if it's a very short circuit in length, then probably not much effect, but it's an accumulative type of thing. And if it's a longer circuit, then those corner effects really do add up to increase the losses. Now, if you look at a ground cool planar waveguide, and I've had this issue many times where customers will send me a circuit and saying it's a lot more lossy than it should be, and it's usually because the ground cool planar waveguide uh, definitely has more losses due to the same plated finish than would a microstrip. And the reason there is on the coplanar layer where it's ground signal ground on the top copper layer, there are coupling fields between the uh, signal conductor and the neighboring ground planes. And those coupling fields are basically using four layers of the plated finish. So there's current density on the sidewalls of those coupling fields. And those, uh, that current density is actually using four layers of ENIG. And what happens is you get a lot more insertion loss when comparing apples to apples between a microstrip circuit and a ground coplanar waveguide. And that's what the charts are showing here. So on the left is uh, all of us is actually using the same material, 8 mil thick RO4003C. On the left are 50 ohm microstrip transmission lines, red curve bare copper, blue curve circuits with ENIG. Difference of losses at 50 gigahertz, about 0.5 dB per inch difference. The uh, chart on the right is the same materials again, except now it's 50 ohm ground to coplanar waveguide. 
difference of bare copper red curve and blue curve enig at 50 gigahertz is about 1.2 dB per inch difference. So a pretty big difference. So design really does make a difference when it comes to uh, the issue of um, final plated finishes and how that affects insertion loss. So uh, let's take a look at something else we did. We did a study uh, with the help of Enthone and McDermott and looking at several different plated finishes. And before we did the study, we thought about the test vehicle in pretty good detail. And what we decided to do was use the 50 ohm microstrip transmission line, really because there's less fabrication variables as compared to the Grand Copander waveguide. Uh, but we used a 50 ohm microstrip transmission line, and then we purposely wanted to make the circuit thin because a thinner circuit is going to be more sensitive to the conductor effects, and we know that the final plated finish has an influence on the conductor effects. Then we used a very smooth copper, rolled copper, and that means there's going to be less circuit to circuit variation due to the surface roughness variation. And then we also used a very low loss materials, uh, DF about 0.0012. We did that to, again, uh, minimize dielectric losses and exaggerate the conductor effects. Again, we're trying to see the difference of conductor effects of these different final plated finishes. Here is a quick uh, shot of the output of the study. I'm going to show uh, a little better data on this in the next slide. Uh, basically, the circuits were not optimized for signal launch, and I just had good signal launch, good return loss to about 40 or 42 gigahertz. So the general trends are okay to look at here, but really we need to truncate the data and look a little bit closer at um, the data up to 40 gigahertz, and that's what's shown here. And what I'm showing is, uh, well, to begin with, the light blue curve is the bare copper circuits, and they are considered the reference. And then you can see there's some other blue curves there as well. And I kept them nearly the same color to basically say that all these circuits behave the same. And that is circuits with bare copper, circuits with OSP, and circuits using immersion silver. I really don't see a significant difference in losses of those three. And then solder mask is the brown curve, it looks like. Immersion 10 green, yellow is Inipig, and red is Enig. Enig is typically the highest loss. Well, every time I've done a study on a lot of different materials and thicknesses and designs, Enig is always the highest loss finish. And you know, it really is a good finish. It's just that it does affect uh, insertion loss. So the, my comment here is Enig's fine to use because it really does have a good track record, it's used a lot in the industry. It's very reliable. But you, as long as you understand there's going to be more losses and you account for those losses, then that's most of the battle right there. So this is also from the same study. In this case, what I'm doing is using the microstrip differential phase length method to look at phase response differences. And in this case, I extracted the dielectric constant from that measurement. Dielectric constant on the left, uh, frequency on the x-axis. And uh, what we find is at lower frequencies, we see some differences in how the circuits behave for phase response. And what's interesting is they are in, they are in the order of conductivity, composite conductivity. And what I mean by that, at very low frequencies for ENIG, electric nickel immersion gold, you actually have the composite conductivity of copper, nickel, and gold. And then as you go up in frequency higher and higher due to skin depth, now you have a composite conductivity of nickel gold. And as you go much, much higher, then you have a conductivity mostly of gold. So that's what's happening at the lower frequencies. As your change in frequency and the skin depth is changing, the composite conductivity is changing, and it's having an effect on the uh, phase uh, response. And the reason I bring this up really is because I've had issues with nickel varying in thickness, which is not unusual, and having an effect on a base station power amplifier at frequencies down around the range that I'm showing here that you can get this variation. So lower frequency, uh, microwave frequencies, the difference of plated finish and the thickness variation that's normal for some of these thicknesses could actually impact the phase response. Uh, another experiment I did was copper plating, and um, copper plating thickness will vary uh, from circuit to circuit. That's pretty normal. Uh, so a lot of circuits that are plated through hole, you drill the hole through, you plate copper through, that's how you make connections through the thickness axis of the circuit. And uh, this copper plating thickness will vary, and on circuits on one panel, there's going to be copper thickness variation. And then panel to panel, there'll be copper plated thickness variation as well. And this copper plating thickness variation uh, can actually have a pretty dramatic effect on the circuit, depending on the circuit design. In some cases, not much influence. Other cases, it could be a pretty big influence. And what I did was uh, I used the same sheet of material to minimize material effects. And it was a 24 by 18 sheet of material of 10 mil RO4350B laminate 
I cut that sheet in half, and now I have two sheets that are 12 by 18, and one sheet was sent off for circuits to be made using thin copper plating, plating very little copper. The other sheet was sent off to have the exact same circuits made with thicker copper plating. And I'll show you the numbers here in a second. And I looked at microstrip and then several different versions of grounded coplanar waveguide. Long story made short, microstrip had very little uh, influence. The RF performance of the microstrip had very little influence due to the difference in copper plating thickness. However, the grounded coplanar waveguides did show a pretty remarkable difference, especially at millimeter wave frequencies. And um, so what I did was the uh, grounded coplanar waveguides, uh, there was really two different designs, tightly coupled, meaning the space between the signal and the neighboring grounds is small, and loosely coupled. And then the copper plating thickness on the final circuits, the thin plated circuits, was one mil thick copper, total copper thickness, and the thick copper plated circuits had three mils. So there's a pretty big difference in copper plating thickness there. And a quick summary of this at millimeter wave frequencies, looking at insertion loss, uh, that's the chart on the right, uh, x-axis frequency, y-axis uh, losses, insertion loss in dB per inch. And what we find is the circuits with the widest conductor and the thickest copper had the lowest loss. That's the purple curve. That's the one labeled W21S12. My naming convention is W21 is the width of the signal conductor. S is the space between the signal conductor and the neighboring grounds, in this case, the 12 mil space. So the widest conductor which to me means the lower conductor losses, and also having thick copper was beneficial too. And my thought there is when the copper is thick, now the sidewalls between the signal and the neighboring ground planes is taller, and that means you're making more use of the air. So electric fields are more in the air, and air is the lowest loss medium, so you're going to have lower insertion loss. Now, the same type of uh, study was done and looking at the phase response and then uh, measuring the effective dielectric constant on the y-axis, frequency on the x-axis. And here I see a little difference, and uh, it's pretty interesting. The one, the circuit with the lowest effective dielectric constant was the circuit with the uh, tightest spacing, which means it's tightly coupled, and that means there's very strong electric fields between the signal conductor and the neighboring ground, and also the tallest or the thickest copper. That had the lowest effective dielectric constant, and my opinion is when it's very tightly coupled, the uh, electric fields are using the air very efficiently. Being thick copper, these sidewalls are much taller, so again, you're using air more efficiently. Air is the lowest dielectric constant, it's one, so that lowers the circuit effective dielectric constant, and that's why the red curve is the lowest effective dielectric constant. Now, on the opposite end of this is the green curve at the top with the highest effective dielectric constant, and that is the circuit that is loosely coupled, a space of 12 mils, and this thinner copper. So it would appear that loosely coupled with thin copper is not using the air as effectively, so it's got a higher effective dielectric constant. Now what's interesting is you remember this is the same sheet of material, just cut in half and had circuits made, and on the same sheet of material I'm seeing a difference of 0.3 in effective dielectric constant. That's a pretty big difference. Now if you look at the exact same design, what's interesting is the W18S6 Thick copper red curve, thin copper blue curve, there's a difference of 0.1 in the effective dielectric constant. And that's, again, using the exact same material, and the only difference is copper plating thickness. It's the same design in this case. And if you look at the uh, loosely coupled design, that's the purple curve and the green curve, same designs again, same material, same everything. The only difference is thick copper, purple curve, green is thin. Uh, then you get a 0. So, I'm sorry, 0. 0.075. Uh, difference in effective dielectric constant. So what it's really saying is the looser coupled circuits are less impacted by the thick and thin copper plating than the tightly coupled circuits. So I'll talk about solder mass real quick. We're getting uh, pretty close to the end here, but I wanted to talk about solder mass some because it does influence insertion loss, and the reason it does that is when solder mask is used for a microstrip or granite coplanar waveguide where the fields can use air, when you cover up the, those fields with solder mask, solder mask has higher dielectric constant than air, so you're going to have increased dielectric losses, of course. Um, and these dielectric losses are dependent on several things, frequency dependent, substrate thickness dependent, and also circuit design configuration. And actually there's others. There's uh, solder mask thickness. That also varies from circuit to circuit. That can have a, a influence on the performance. And also moisture absorption. Solder mask often has pretty high moisture absorption. So there's more influences than what I'm just showing here, but a quick example is showing on the right chart the performance of 
MicroStrip edge couple bandpass filters on the exact same material for the transmission line shown on the left, which is 20 mil thick RO4350B laminate. And the, uh, the difference on the filters on the right is a difference of about 0.2 dB uh, at about 3 gigahertz. And if you roughly translate that into dB per inch, that's about 0.05 dB per inch at 3 gigahertz. And if you look at the transmission line comparison on the left between bare copper blue curve green curve with solder mask and you zoom in close to 3 gigahertz, you see there's a difference of about 0 0.02, 0 0.03. So what it's really saying is the edge coupled features of the filter on the right are more impacted by the solder mask than a transmission line. And that kind of makes sense because the edge coupled features, you're going to have a lot of electric fields coupled between the copper conductors and now with having solder mask between there, you're going to use more of the solder mask than you will error and that's going to increase the losses. This is a quick chart that shows differences in thickness. So I'm using the same substrate and actually the same copper, in this case rolled copper, very smooth, and I'm using 3003 laminate. And the difference is really uh, thick and thin uh, circuits. So the green curve is the uh, thick, I'm sorry, the thin circuit, 5 mil thick RL3003, and the curve of the top purple curve is also 5 mil thick 3003. The difference is the curve on top has solder mask, the green curve on the bottom, does not, just bare copper. And you can see for a thin circuit, there is a pretty big difference in insertion loss. And that's really because the solder mask is uh, enough thickness that it is impacting the overall dielectric constant of the circuit more. Because a five mil thick circuit and you put a one mil thick solder mask on there, that one mil thick is a pretty good percentage of the overall dielectric of the circuit. In the case of a 20 mil thick circuit, and that's the blue curve and the red curve, 20 mil thick RL4350B, Blue curve is bare copper, red curve is solder mask. There's not near as much difference in the effect of solder mask on the circuit because the solder mask has, it's less of a percentage of the overall dielectric of the material. So uh, let's look at moisture absorption and how that can influence the RF performance. And uh, here's a curve that's really looking at insertion loss differences between microstrip circuits built on the 5 mil RL3003 and microstrip circuits built on a competitive material that is a PPE-based material that has moisture absorption of 0.3%, which normally is considered pretty good, but you can see there's a pretty big difference here. And what this testing is, is testing the circuits at baseline room temperature and then exposing them to 85-85, 85-degrees 85 C, 85% RH for three days, 72 hours, and then test them again. And the difference of the uh, RL3003 circuits, there's a difference of 0.1 dB per inch at 79 gigahertz, and the difference in insertion loss at 79 gigahertz for the competitive materials is much more, about eight times more, about 0.8 dB per inch difference at 79 gigahertz. So moisture absorption can really be a big deal, even with the numbers as low as 0.3. In the case of RO3003, the moisture absorption is very low at 0.05. This is the same testing, except now I'm looking at phase response and extracting the dielectric constant on the y-axis. Frequency on the x-axis, the difference in dielectric constant between room temperature testing and the circuits being conditioned three days at 85-85 for the RL3003 materials is 0 0.005. And in the case of the competitive materials, PPE-based thermal set materials at the 79 gigahertz, difference in dielectric constant is uh, about eight times the difference, 0 0.04. So moisture absorption can be a pretty big deal. Last slide, TCDK, term temperature coefficient of dielectric constant. And this is showing uh, some real life measurements I did on filters. And these are microstrip edge coupled bandpass filters. And I'm showing frequency, uh, center frequency differences normalized at room temperature and normalized to the center frequency. And what you can see is the materials with the higher TCDK, that's the green curve, uh, are definitely much more affected by the change in temperature, which is on the X axis going from about zero degrees up to, I think it's about 90 degrees C it looks like. And you can see the materials with the better uh, TCDK um, of uh, about 16 or 17 for the, uh, the uh, RT Duroid 6002 materials. That's the blue curve, not much difference there. The red curve is the RL4350B materials, a little bit higher TCDK around the range of 50, which is still considered good. And you can see there's not much difference there, actually. Uh, there is another thing I want to throw out here. For tightly coupled, edge-coupled features, so a wide band filter, let's say, when the, the copper features are very tightly coupled and very accurate or very high frequency where the dimensions are very critical, 
having a laminate with a higher CTE can be problematic. So as the circuit heats up, it's very possible that these circuit dimensions actually change and will change due to the expansion and contraction of the laminate. And as that happens, the distance between these features could change. Now, to be honest, I don't see that very often. That's a little unusual, but occasionally very tightly coupled features, you can see a change like that. So that's all I have. I feel like I went through that pretty fast, but I used a lot of my time. Uh, I wanted to end with uh, showing you a screenshot of our Technology Support Hub and invite you to become a member. We've got a lot of good information there. We have free software, free calculators you can have access to. We also have Raj mobile apps. We have technical papers, white papers, trade show presentations. We have many videos, short videos usually, that are there just as introduction to a topic. Some videos are actually at uh, trade shows uh, when we present on longer, longer topics. And then, of course, you can also contact an engineer in your region. So that's all I have, and I think I have a few minutes for questions. Yes, you do, John. Thanks uh, for the very detailed and informative presentation. Clearly, you have a lot of experience in this area, and we appreciate you sharing that. Uh, we do have time for questions, so I'll encourage our audience, if you have a question you'd like to ask John, please use the Q&A box on your screen. Type it in, and let's see how many uh, questions we can pose to John in the next few minutes. Uh, we'll start with, um, since immersion tin has less conductivity than nickel or gold, why does ENIG have more loss than immersion tin? Yeah, I've been asked that a few times. That's really a good question, because normally you think of uh, the nickel gold, nickel being one quarter of the conductivity of copper is going to have uh, worse losses, and it does. But tin is actually lower conductivity than that. So in theory, you would think that tin would have even more insertion loss. But tin is actually not ferromagnetic, and nickel is. So nickel does have a magnetic property where nickel does cause some losses to the magnetic field. So it's got a complex permeability that is more problematic. So the nickel involved with nickel gold is more lossy not just because of the electrical conductivity, and that's part of it, but another part of it is actually there is a magnetic element where you get some losses due to that. Hmm, interesting. So one of our viewers is asking, uh, first of all, says many thanks, and then is asking for the 2.4 to 5.8 gigahertz range. Are there any factors that you say really cannot be ignored? Um... Well, that's a good one. <laughs> you know, what really surprises me is that one chart I showed on the uh, plating, um, the plating differences, and how much they change in that range of frequencies. And the like, if you're using uh, ENIG, electric nickel immersion gold, I know for a fact that that nickel thickness does vary up and down a good amount just on one panel of circuits. So from circuit to circuit on the same panel, you can get a variation. And as that nickel uh, plating thickness moves up and down, that can affect that curve that I showed. And uh, that would be one concern. Uh, another concern is in that range of frequencies, copper surface roughness can have more impact or less impact. So the copper surface roughness has an impact on phase velocity and insertion loss. But how that happens is it's a relationship between skin depth and copper surface roughness. And basically, once you get to a high enough frequency where the skin depth is the same dimension as the copper surface roughness or less, then that's where the copper surface roughness is going to start having a bigger impact. And it just so happens in that range of frequencies is where the skin depth is getting thinner and thinner to the point where there's several coppers that you will be using the, the roughened portion of that copper, and then the very smooth copper you will not. So that's kind of an interesting range of frequencies you've got to be aware of, uh, aware of uh, for the copper surface roughness. And uh, on that point about copper surface rough, roughness, you've talked about how it impacts wave velocity and design decay. How about impedance? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a really good question, too. And uh, it does make an impact on impedance, but not as much as I thought. I went off and did a bunch of testing, and I really had to think why that was. And what I came up with is if you do some modeling on impedance, just a microstrip transmission line, and you look at four different variables that are usually most impactful, and that being the substrate thickness, the conductor width, copper thickness, and the dielectric constant change, uh, what's happening is, uh, you know, it depends on the thickness. It depends on a lot of things. But in general, there's a hierarchy where the most influential property 
for impedance is actually the substrate thickness, and then after that is actually the conductor width, and after that copper thickness, and after that the dielectric constant. So a change in dielectric constant does not impact the impedance as much as I thought, and you can do these models on any kind of uh, simple impedance modeling software and find that hierarchy to be true. Uh, but basically what's happening is this phase velocity difference due to the copper roughness is affecting the, the uh, circuit perceived dielectric constant and changing the dielectric constant. But the dielectric constant change is not a major variable for impedance as the circuit perceives it. So there is a difference in impedance due to the copper surface roughness, but not as much as I would have expected. Interesting. One of our uh Viewers is asking, what method do you use to extract the dissipation factor, and is it design dependent? Well, that's a good one. Uh, dissipation factor is a tough one. So if you look at test methods, and I've got one book on test methods for characterizing microwave materials, and I think there's 81 different test methods in there, and each one of them have pros and cons. So that's really tough when you get into test methods. And dissipation factor is definitely one of the more difficult ones. It's really hard to find a test method that's good at measuring dissipation factor. And the ones that are good at it are usually very engineering intense, like some of the waveguide measurement techniques. Uh, a simple technique that you can measure dissipation factor relatively accurate is SPDR, split post dielectric resonator. And we actually have four of those. We have one that's tuned at 5 gigahertz, 10, 15, and 20 gigahertz. And our thought was we would use these different SPDRs at these different frequencies, and based on the performance across those range of frequencies, we could extrapolate the performance to higher frequency and understand the dissipation factor at higher frequencies. Now, SPDR is actually evaluating the XY plane of the material for dielectric constant and dissipation factor. And uh, in the case of the dielectric constant, you can see a difference with SPDR looking at the XY plane dielectric constant as compared to the Z axis using a different test method. But for dissipation factor, you really don't see much difference when you measure the XY plane as compared to the Z axis. And there's a little bit of reason behind that in the math. I won't get into that. But uh, basically, uh, an accurate way of measuring dissipation factor, I think, is using SPDR, and you can get these SPDRs at different frequencies, and then based on that information, you could extrapolate it to higher frequency, too. Okay. Another question, can you comment on uh, EPIG as a surface finish? I think they mean ENIG, but it's written EPIG. Oh, yeah, there's uh, two of them. There's e NEPIG and also ENIG. And ENIG, consistently, when I compare these two fin finishes, NEPIG and ENIG, uh, ENIG is always higher losses than NEPIG. And I struggle to know why that is. I've talked to some of the suppliers uh, of these plated finishes, and they've given me some reasons, and there's some metallurgy theory behind it as well. But I guess I don't understand it very well. But I can tell you consistently from many different circuits I've tested, different designs, different thicknesses, uh, ENIG is always the worst loss between that and any pig. And uh, as for how it's actually used on a circuit, I don't know what to tell you for you know how reliable one finish is as the other or how one may have uh, different issues like black spots, one might be better than the other. I think any peg is a little more robust than ENIG, but I'm not 100% certain on that. That would be a good question for the manufacturers of these plated finishes, actually. All right. Have you evaluated the effect of conformal coatings on insertion loss? Um, I'll, I'll say kind of, sort of. <laughs> so what I've done was I actually looked at something that is um, uh, pyrrolene, and pyrrolene has different types. There's an N type and a C type. And I have looked at, uh, I believe it was C type years ago, and what I found from that experience was no difference whatsoever in phase response or insertion loss. So whatever pyrrolene C is doing, uh, it does protect the copper so it doesn't oxidize. Uh, it does good things for aging as well. It actually protects the substrate too so it doesn't oxidize for long-term thermal aging. So that particular um, coating is uh, pretty good for that, but that's very I have very limited experience, and that's just about all I have on that subject. All right, and then another question, are the XY directions marked on uh, Roger's materials? That's another good question. You know, it's not marked in that sense, but we do label the materials, uh, and we the label is always put on the axis that is consistent. 
And boy, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I don't remember exactly what that is. We label one axis specifically, the green direction we label or the cross green. I don't remember. So that's a good question to talk to our customer service people about. Uh, sorry, I don't remember that, but there is a way to know what the X, Y direction is of the material, that's for sure. But in my presentations, I always consider the Z axis the thickness, and uh, the X, Y, I usually just call it as a plane. But to really know what's what on our material, you probably want to contact our customer service and ask them how it's labeled, because the label is consistent for our green direction versus uh, not green direction. All right, and our final question, what is the typical TCDK value for PDFE? Yeah, PTFE actually has really bad uh, TCDK. I think the raw PTFE is in the range of uh, like 400 parts per million per degree C. So a change in temperature with a pure PTFE material is going to make a pretty big difference in dielectric constant. Now, PTFE is uh, very consistent for the raw dielectric constant and losses and things like that, and it's a very low loss material, excellent material for a lot of properties, but when it comes to TCDK, Unfortunately, that's one property that it's not very good at. It's very high TCDK, and because of that, when we do formulations with the base being PTFE, we do we go out of our way, actually, with a lot of tricks that we do uh, to make sure we minimize that TCDK. Uh, and it, it gets into a lot of different types of ceramic fillers that I'm not expert with, but ceramic is not just ceramic. There is actually quite a science to it. And we've mastered that over the years, and you can see that in our O3003 laminate where it's got a TCDK of 3, which is about as good as it gets. But anyway, the raw PTFE itself really does have a very high TCDK, and that's one of the reasons why you usually don't see pure PTFE circuits. All right. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time for questions, so if we didn't get to your question, uh, we will pass them along, all the questions to John, and you can certainly contact the uh, local Rogers application support team get more information. Um, I want to thank John Coonrod and Rogers for today's webinar on improving design success by understanding dielectric constant test methods. Obviously, there's a lot to it. It's uh, not a simple subject. The webinar has been recorded, and it will be available to watch within about an hour. You'll find it at the events section of the Microwave Journal website. So if your colleagues would benefit from watching this and they weren't able to attend, please let them know. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today.